Falling sails had seen the axe fall on Captain Britain's first series. For now, he would have to be content with the supporting roles in other heroes' titles, beginning with Spider-Man. Would this change give the character a new lease of life? I could give you the short answer, but where's the fun in that? Exactly one week after the release of the 39th and final issue of Captain Britain's weekly comic, the Captain could be found in his new home, as his comic merged with Marvel UK's Spider-Man title. This resulted in a name change for the Wallcrawlers comic, not for the first time, nor would it be the last. Okay, now keep up. In February of 1973, Marvel UK launched only its second ever title, Spider-Man Comics Weekly. This was filled with the usual mix of reprints and lasted for 157 issues before merging with another Marvel UK comic book titled, rather unspecifically, The Superheroes. Thus, we now had Super Spider-Man with the superheroes, not and the superheroes. This title lasted less than a year before it was merged with The Titans and became Super Spider-Man and The Titans, not with The Titans. Then, in July of 1977, Captain Britain Weekly got the chop, the Titans got the old heave-ho, and we got Super Spider-Man and Captain Britain. This was released just one week after Captain Britain Weekly came to an end, and we were halfway through a storyline. So it's no surprise that the creative team of Bud Budjansky and Jim Lawrence on words, and Ron Wilson and Pablo Marcos on pictures, returns. Although now we also have Mike Esposito credited with something called zips. I have no idea what zips are in a comic book, but considering the fact that Mike is an artist, I can't help but wonder if he was drafted in to redraw Her Majesty's face. As in just seven days, she's gone from looking like the Queen Mother to looking as she should. Sadly, the Queen's face is the most interesting aspect of this chapter of the tale as we wander mindlessly towards its conclusion in issue 232. The only thing of vague interest in this chapter is that Di Thomas is instrumental in the death of the villain, something which Captain Britain is obviously chuffed about. For the next two issues, Brian is up against a mechanical Loch Ness monster. Why? All together now, because Britain! A character in it even says Ock Eye, so we know that they're Scottish. Only half Scottish, perhaps. Otherwise, he would also have said, the new. By the way, if you've come here hoping to see a selection of Spider-Man covers, you've hit the jackpot. Because despite sharing joint billing, Captain Britain only ever features on his debut issue, and then a couple of little corner boxes. If you thought Nessie was something, just wait until you see issue 235. This storyline is unintentionally one of the funniest I have ever seen in comic books. Bud Budjansky has got out while the going was good, and the storyline that Larry Lieber and Jim Lawrence give us is, well, see for yourself. Captain Britain is on patrol, high above the streets of London, and he says the city looks peaceful. But despite that, a mad killer has been on the loose. Pfft, yeah, I'm looking at him, mate. He also sees a woman out walking, and he thinks, a whole city in terror, yet some dolly bird's out walking alone. Dolly bird? What is this, carry on captain? Nonetheless, his luck's in, her luck isn't, because she is quickly attacked by a werewolf. Now, wouldn't it have been cool if this was a werewolf by night or maybe the man wolf? But no, it is just a, your average everyday kind of werewolf. Naturally, Captain Britain flies in to try to save the woman and the two of them fight. And at one point, it says uh, that he lengthens his scepter to its full fighting size. Um, I didn't realise the star scepter did that, the whole extending thing. I guess they got rid of the, uh, the quarter staff too soon. Nonetheless, its full fighting size, crikey, look at it. It's like a flagpole. Anyway, that fends off an attack from the werewolf on the captain. But then the werewolf uh, returns his attention to the woman. And Captain Britain thinks, uh oh, he's grabbed the girl. If I try to fight him now, he'll kill her. Will he? Why? Anyway, he chucks her in the River Thames nonetheless, and Cap dives in after her. 
Whilst Cap's in the water, the werewolf reaches out to grab the star scepter that he left uh, on the pavement. But he recoils in pain and agony. Because it says here, for by its very power of goodness, the mystic scepter has scorched his foul flesh. Ugh, the very power of goodness? Am I the only person that's rooting for the werewolf right now? The werewolf escapes. And then, next morning, we're at Thames University. And we catch up with Brian, uh, Courtney Ross, and new guy, Lord Roddy Kemp. I'm sure he won't play a significant role in this story at all. Actually, straight away, uh, we see that he's wearing the ring. Hold on, the ring? What ring? The devil's head ring, of course. It looks familiar, doesn't it? Because the werewolf was wearing it. Apparently, uh, let's have a look. Okay, well, there's nothing really apparent that... Oh, what, that? I just thought it was a knuckle. Okay, so a ring that the werewolf was wearing is the same as a ring that this uh, coincidentally new student, uh, Lord Roddy Kemp, is wearing on his finger. Seeing this ring and being the suspicious type, Brian instantly suspects a link between the two. Courtney Ross accepts an invite uh, to the Lord's Homestead, which is Darkmoor Castle. While she goes and visits that castle, Brian goes to the library to research Darkmoor Castle and uh, the family's history, and he doesn't like what he finds. Murderers, witches, feudal tyrants, that's it, he has to go and rescue Courtney. As he approaches Darkmoor Castle, uh, some of the stone gargoyles on the top of it come to life and attack him. And he says, my God, the stone figures, they're moving, flying, as though they were actually alive and not made of stone, presumably. They battle him, and as he plummets to the ground, seemingly lifeless, we see Courtney Ross asleep in bed, and looming over her is the threatening figure of a vampire. Now you're confused. Well, we can attempt to clear up the confusion with issue 236, although I can't make any guarantees. As the vampire is about to bite into Courtney's neck, one of the gargoyles delivers uh, Brian's unconscious body to him. As the vampire begins to tie up Brian, he seemingly instantaneously breaks free from the ropes and then spots on the hand of the vampire the devil's head ring. Now your challenge, dear viewer, is to work out the relevance of the ring. Are Lord Kemp, the werewolf, the vampire, are they three totally separate people? Or is Lord Kemp uh, the vampire or the werewolf? Whilst you ponder that, we see that the vampire has turned into a bat and flies off with Brian in close pursuit. The bat thinks of a spell. Is that how it works? And this spell brings a suit of armor to life and it battles Brian. Brian then uses the star scepter, swings it at the head of the suit of armor and shouts, off of his head. He's then shocked to see that there isn't actually anybody inside the armor. Wait a minute, so what? He was actually intending to decapitate someone? He eventually defeats the suit of armor by using a mace on the end of presumably a sharp chain uh, to swipe through the suit of armor's ankles. Now the vampire who had changed back into a vampire uh, as he brought the suit of armor to life is now a bat again. And not only that, but he's brought uh, to life two uh, metal uh, uh, kind of panthers. Understandably, the two uh, metal panthers defeat Captain Britain. And when he comes to, after losing consciousness, he is under the hypnotic influence of the vampire. And the vampire says, why are you here? What made you come here in the first place? And Captain Britain uh, tells him that he learned all about the secrets of the uh, house and the family at Thames University Library. That means the vampire is now heading to Thames University Library because he wants to get rid of uh, all clues to his real past, his, his secret identi identity. The next thing we see after we see the vampire turn back into a bat again and fly away from Darkmoor Castle is at Thames University Library, Lord Kemp walking through the door. And he says, I must find the antiquarian section. So at the moment, it's still a bit ambiguous. So is Lord Kemp the vampire? Having flown from Darkmoor Castle, he's now at the university library. 
or because we haven't seen any transformations, um, is it just coincidence? It isn't very clear. That is, until he pulls the curtain aside, sees the full moon, and transforms into the werewolf. Meanwhile, back in Darkmoor Castle, Captain Britain has regained not just consciousness, but control of his own mind. He's free from the vampire's influence, but he isn't free physically, because he's been locked up in the dungeon of Darkmoor Castle. One of the vampire's lackeys is outside the uh, cell door, and although Captain Britain is tied up, the Star Scepter isn't. And he thinks, rise, Scepter, rise. And he has to concentrate to will his staff into motion. Didn't realise that was a thing. Incredibly, the guy guarding Captain Britain falls for the classic, as Cap says there's a horde of monsters behind him. The lackey turns round, sees nothing, obviously. But whilst he's distracted, the Star Scepter flies towards him, hits him in the throat, and then kind of wraps itself around the back of his head, holding him tight uh, to the bars of the door. Whilst the lackey is being held against the bars, Captain Britain says, unlock the door or my Star Scepter will choke you. So with trembling hand, it says here, he unlocks the door, freeing Captain Britain. And again, there's mention of the power of goodness, but the Star Scepter uh, revitalizes Brian and brings him back to full strength. He then escapes from this dungeon and is off to find Courtney Ross and get them both out of the castle. Meanwhile, at Thames uh, University, we see there was a rock concert going on. And halfway through the performance, there was a crash as the werewolf throws himself uh, through the window. I'll forgive that smashed window because it's the kind of thing that a werewolf would do. He then not only attacks the band, but also the crowd of students there watching. We have to look at issue 237 to get an insight into the minds of some of these students. As one of them shouts out, there must be a full moon out. That is when a werewolf's bloodlust drives him berserk. All the other time, they're perfectly reasonable gentlemen. With Cap busy searching for Courtney back in Darkmoor Castle, it's down to Di Thomas and his men uh, to protect the students of Thames University. They don't do a very good job. I mean, don't get me wrong, no more students are hurt, but they also don't stop the werewolf. And in fact, he escapes quite easily. Meanwhile, back at Darkmoor Castle, Brian has found Courtney Ross. She looks like she's asleep, but as he tries to rouse her, she doesn't respond. Then something strange happens. She ages before his very eyes. She then grabs a hold of his throat and then fades away to nothing. And he says it was just another of the Baron's black magic tricks. Leaving the room, he finds the butler, the lackey, and he says, right, I need answers from you. And we assume he got them because the next time we see him, he is flying to Regent's Park. Regent's Park is the site of London Zoo and it seems that the werewolf has gone there to free the wolves that are locked up in cages. As Brian lands, he says, Lord Kemp, I presume, otherwise known as son of a bat. A bat? The, the werewolf? What? What? They then have a pretty decent fight, during the course of which they end up on Tower Bridge, naturally, and the werewolf falls off of the bridge uh, into the Thames. Now Brian dives into the water, searching for him, but he can't find him. So he assumes that's it, he's gone forever. We, and also a guy working on a nearby barge, know differently. Because at the point where the werewolf fell into the water, we see, leaving it, a bat. What? We need to move on. We need to move on to the final part in issue 238. I can only hope we're going to get some answers. Well, we do, very quickly as well. It doesn't necessarily clear things up though, because as Brian flies back to Darkmoor uh, to search for Courtney, we are told it is confirmed that the werewolf has indeed turned into that bat. And not only that, but that flutters its way to Darkmoor Castle, and as it lands, it turns into the vampire. Now brace yourself for what must be the most ludicrous thing I've ever seen in a comic. Captain Britain lands 
um, in the grounds of Darkmoor Castle. He's a bit cautious about just going straight to the castle because if you remember, it's guarded by those gargoyles. So he wants to avoid them. And the way he does that is by getting a load of branches from nearby bushes and tying them around himself because he happened to bring some rope along. So he's now camouflaged as a bush, but that's not it. Because the next part of his cunning plan, he flies towards the castle. He's disguised as a bush and flying towards the castle. Incredible. The gargoyles are probably turning to each other saying, what's he doing now? Not only that, but it says here that not only will the leaves camouflage me because he's just your average everyday flying shrub, but they will absorb the goodness that emanates from my star scepter. So those grotesque squatters on the castle roof won't know I'm about. What are you saying? What? Because the leaves on the flying bush are now good leaves. Somehow the stone gargoyles that defy the laws of aeronautics won't know he's there. He lands at the family crypt behind the castle because when he was looking at the books in the library, um, they told him that there was a secret tunnel there that led into the castle. He takes off his disguise and enters the crypt, whereon he is attacked by skeletons. Meanwhile, the vampire is talking to some entity that he's conjured up. Who is the entity? It is Satan himself. Now I should just point out that uh, Courtney Ross is alive and she's conscious and she's there uh, whilst the vampire is talking to Satan. It freaks her out. So she runs off down the corridor. And at the end of the corridor, who does she bump into? Lord Kemp, of all people. She thinks she's kind of saved, but as she looks at him, he changes. And he changes, well, into the vampire. Now don't go thinking there are two vampires because there aren't. There is only one. The vampire that she ran away from is this same vampire. He just somehow appeared at the end of the corridor wearing glasses and a totally different outfit. Don't worry though, Captain Britain is here to save the day. Because just as the vampire is gloating over Courtney about how Satan himself taught him the black art of shape-shifting, which he clearly loves doing, Captain Britain bursts in and says, just watch me shift the shape of your head. That's a good line. He also says, I dub thee Knight of the Cracked Skull. It's not so good a line. So just to clarify, there is only one vampire. And the vampire is Lord Kemp. But he is also a werewolf. Now really, thinking about it, that's a pretty good concept. Having a character that is a vampire who has also at some point been bitten by a werewolf, so, so he has the two curses, if you like. That's a really good concept. Handled, obviously, terribly. There is another fight, the final fight, during which the vampire changes again into the werewolf. During that fight, Brian sees a silver goblet and breaking the top off of it, he then fashions the uh, stem into a silver stake basically and plunges that into the heart of the werewolf. And that prompts another good line from the captain. Sleep tight, Baron. Born with a silver spoon in his mouth and died with a silver stake through his heart. That's great. I think a new career beckons. So the Count, Lord Kemp, the vampire, the werewolf, whoever they are, they're dead. And Brian sets light to Darkmoor Castle as he flies off with Courtney in his arms. Insane. How do you top that? Issue 239 sees a new adventure in which Captain Britain is left at the mercy of Dr. Claw. Mm, wonder how long before he dies. Ron Wilson and Pablo Marcos then share out the art duties for the next few issues until Captain Britain and co are victorious in issue 242 and Dr. Claw is left for dead, naturally. We finally have something of note in issue 243 where, as the cover announces, Captain Britain meets the Slaymaster. 
Now you may be thinking that this is the latest in a long list of third-rate villains, and you wouldn't be wrong. However, Slaymaster is that rare thing, a villain from Captain Britain's days in the red suit that returns in future tales. Not only did he go on to battle the Alan Davis era Captain Britain, but he also battled Betsy Braddock. Not just battled her either, he is the character that gouged out her eyes. Anyway, we aren't covering that storyline, yet. Let's check out his first appearance. It's our usual creative team of Jim Lawrence and Larry Lieber writing, and Ron Wilson on art, joined this time by Mike Esposito on inks. A scream pierces the night. It's not a werewolf this time, but somebody has been killed. Killed by an arrow through the heart. Captain Britain is flying nearby, he hears the scream and he flies down to investigate. A woman walks into the room to see him standing over the body of the dead man. She says that the man is her father, Sir Thurlow Archer, and she thinks that Captain Britain is the guy that killed him. He explains that's not the case, and then he gets on the phone uh, to the police. Actually, superheroes should do that a lot more, shouldn't they? We don't see enough of them getting onto the phone to the emergency services. Once he's done his civic duty, uh, the woman screams and says that she saw the guy who we presume did it uh, running into the corridor. Captain Britain runs out there to see the lift door closing. He leaps through uh, the lift door and in there there's a little device that emits some kind of fumes and they knock out Captain Britain. We then discover that the woman who sent him in that direction isn't a woman at all. She is in fact the Slay Master in disguise. And looking at this picture, I don't know if his arms are overly long or his legs are underly short. Despite those strange proportions, it's a really good beginning, especially for this comic, because we've been through some tough times, haven't we, with these storylines. The fumes in the lift weren't enough to knock out Captain Britain, and he bursts through the door. But as he does so, he is knocked unconscious by a karate chop from Slaymaster, who uses some foul language when he calls Captain Britain a twit. Before long, Di Thomas and his team arrive on the scene. Naturally, Slaymaster is gone, but Captain Britain is still there, so they assume that he is behind Sir Thurlow Archer's death. Captain Britain explains, no, it's not me. Uh, where's the girl? She'll explain everything. Um, it's his daughter. In an interesting reflection of the times, Di Thomas points out that Sir Thurlow Archer didn't have a daughter. He's a bachelor. Because... I guess in the 70s, unless you were married, you couldn't have children. Therefore, suspicion falls again onto Brian Braddock. And Di Thomas says, the truth is, you did Archer in, and we arrived before you had time to scarper. So you tried to con us by playing unconscious. Is he on drugs or something? Captain Britain doesn't stay in cuffs for long, and he flies off, realizing he now needs to prove his innocence. The next day, Brian catches up with his sister, Betsy, hurrah. She's on a modeling assignment and he's there chatting to her, but also reading the paper. And it talks about how Sir Archer's death was the latest in a string of murders uh, called the Gimmick Murders. All of the victims were collectors and Sir Archer was a collector of rare weapons. Later that afternoon, Brian meets up with his brother, Jamie Braddock. I love what Chris Claremont did with Jamie Braddock in the Excalibur series. Jamie is preparing for a race, and as he's putting the finishing touches to his car, they talk about these murders of uh, famous collectors. And Jamie says, well, there's one here today. The guy starting the race is a collector of famous racing cars, and his name is Major Gunn. Now that doesn't sound too promising. So Brian quickly changes into Captain Britain, and he flies towards the Major as he's about to pull the trigger on the starting pistol. But it's too late. The trigger is pulled, and the gun explodes. We would then have to wait a full week to find out what happens. Of course, we can just do it straight away. The first page of the next episode has a really good uh, image of Slaymaster. It seems the limb business has been sorted out. He's there because he wants to steal uh, one of Major Gun's motor cars that has a gold-plated engine. Captain Britain, as we know, is also there. So the two of them meet for the first time and fight. It's a nice dynamic fight, 
but it's one in which Slaymaster uh, gets the slip from Captain Britain by uh, enveloping him in a big cloud of mist. Slaymaster then joins up with two of his accomplices that helped uh, to steal the motor car. And within moments, he has killed both of them so that he now has all the proceeds from the gold plated engine. The next day, uh, Captain Britain drops in on uh, Inspector Di Thomas and he does it in the traditional superhero way by smashing through a window. Now, I know this happens a lot in superhero comics and it's more often than not the hero, not the baddie that's doing it. But there's usually a life at stake or uh, time is of the urgency. In this instance, he's just visiting Di Thomas and Di Thomas even says, have you heard of a door? And he says, well, if I came through the door, I'd probably get handcuffs slapped on me. Okay, well, that's criminal damage, so you're gonna be nicked anyway. And then they just carry on having a conversation, I guess, tiptoeing around the shards of shattered glass on the floor. Interpol have contacted Di Thomas and told him about Slaymaster. Maybe he believes that Slaymaster is behind all the deaths, maybe not. So Captain Britain isn't entirely off the hook yet. Then he gets a phone call from his sister. Uh, saying that her son Herbie is in London and is going to see uh, Mr. Waxman's uh, new superhero museum, uh, where there is also a prize comic book collection. We then see Herbie at the superhero museum as Mr. Waxman is showing him around. He shows him the replicas of Thor, Spider-Man, Electro-Man. Electro-Man? It isn't Electro-Man, it's the Slay Master in disguise and he leaps into action, electrocuting Mr. Waxman. Meanwhile, Captain Britain and Di Thomas are talking about the fact that there is this great collection of comic books in Mr. Waxman's uh, building. And Di says, could Waxman be the next collector killed? And Captain Britain says, yes, slain somehow by a wax man, because there always has to be a pun involved. Back at the museum, Herbie says, you're not Electro Man, if there is such a person. And the Slay Master says, nope, that's right, and now I'm going to get what I've come for. Which is the one and only Mint Edition, most prized by comic book fans throughout the world. Wow, what is it? Tell us, Slay Master, what, what comic are you referring to? At that point, Captain Britain arrives to try to foil the robbery. And at this point, we're at the end of the second part of the story. And so far, it has been by far the best Captain Britain story. The villain, uh, the design of the villain, his characterization, uh, his dialogue are all top notch. It's on a par with American comic books of the day, which is really saying something because so far all of these stories have been uh, way below that standard. In fact, the only time during this story so far that the quality has dipped a bit is when Captain Britain's involved. We need to move on, mainly because I want to know what comic book this is that he's referring to and we find out pretty quickly. It is the world's only mint condition copy of the first Spider-Man comic. So does he mean Amazing Spider-Man issue one or Amazing Fantasy issue 15? Actually, it does look like they've scribbled on the front of it, Spider-Man. So I guess they're saying Amazing Spider-Man issue one. I'm a massive Spider-Man fan. I would kill uh, to own that, but I don't think it's the most uh, coveted comic in the world. That's got to be Action Comics issue one, surely. I digress. Captain Britain is there, and he tries to stop Slaymaster from stealing the comic. He fails, and not only that, but he also fails to stop Slaymaster from kidnapping little Herbie. Before too long, Di Thomas turns up, and he's furious with Captain Britain because again he's turned up at a murder, and Captain Britain is there. Captain Britain says Slaymaster killed Waxman. Not only that, but he must have kidnapped Freddy. Freddy? Who the hell's Freddy? What about Herbie? Di Thomas isn't buying it, and that means it's time for Captain Britain to be arrested again. And that means it's time for Captain Britain to avoid being arrested again. And he flies off in an attempt to rescue Freddy, Herbie, Robbie, Bobby, Jimmy, Peter. We are then told that Slaymaster's final job will be to steal the Golden Griffin. After Brian has saved Herbie, Freddy, whoever, we see him flying through the sky, uh, thinking about the fact that he found this little griffin, possibly a clue. 
He then sees Slaymaster flying through the sky. Little does he realize that it isn't really Slaymaster, but it's a laser image projected by Slaymaster from a nearby building. He uses that to entice Captain Britain to a particular location. And when he lands, he sees that there is a fountain statue in the shape of a griffin. This must be where the Slay Master was heading for his next job. The griffin statue is in the grounds of a stately home. And as Brian lands beside it, armed security emerge to arrest him because they were tipped off that he would be coming to steal the golden griffin from Lady Healer. Lady Healer? Oh no, now is not the time to be named after one of the world's only venomous lizards. Lady Healer herself is watching from a balcony and she says, oh good, the guards uh, can turn him over to police while she gets her beauty sleep. Her beauty sleep? No, nah, too easy. Sadly, she doesn't get that beauty sleep because naturally uh, there is a healer monster in her bedroom that bites on her arm. That means the Slay Master will be able to get the Golden Griffin statue uh, from her room. Captain Britain, of course, gets there too late to stop this, but he does see Slay Master in there. And Slay Master is saying that he's now completed all of his contracts and it's the last item that Kharkov wanted. There's a brief scuffle that ends with Slay Master uh, firing gas at Captain Britain, which means, you've guessed it, Slay Master escapes and Captain Britain is going to be found with the body of the victim again. Not only that, but he has a rather menacing lizard looking at him. In 246, we see the police arrive in time to, of course, find the scene that we are now so familiar with. Although not quite as familiar as seeing the police trying and failing to apprehend Captain Britain. It's like every single issue. They say, hold it, Britain. And he says, no, you hold it, stupid. It's a bit childish. He, of course, escapes their clutches, but as he flies out the window, Di Thomas is on the ground below and he grabs his attention and says, I've got to give you a, a bit of a tip. Interpol have been in touch and they say that wherever Slaymaster carries out a contract, he always hides out in that city's sewers. What, even if they've got like really small pipes? Cap then flies off in search of sewers, presumably. And whilst he's in the sky, he sees in the air uh, a giant glowing death's head. He says, it can only be Slaymasters. Why? I have no idea what kind of technology Slaymaster is using here because this giant floating death's head then zaps Captain Britain. Then, as Cap falls from the sky, a giant a robot serpent emerges uh, from the sewers below and grabs him in its jaws. They do like robots in this comic strip. But this robotic snake doesn't kill Captain Britain. Instead, uh, it takes him through the tunnels and uh, deposits him in the uh, heart of the Slaymaster's high-tech lair. Slaymaster then gives him a bit of a kick to the face just to knock him unconscious. And then we see that he has been strung up uh, over the water of the sewer in which there lurks a shark. Slaymaster casually lights a cigarette as he explains that the shark is a grey nurse shark. Come on, Jaws has been out by now. Everyone knows that they should have used a great white. And he leaves him. Slaymaster gets in his boat and leaves Captain Britain because obviously uh, he is going to die in the jaws of that shark. Very Batman-esque. Just like those classic episodes of Batman, the plan is doomed to fail. Captain Britain regains consciousness and he's desperately trying to reach for the Star Scepter. Why doesn't he just control it with his mind like he did before? Oh, can't you do that now? He decides in the end to swing, uh, get leverage and then get a hold of the Star Scepter. He then uses that to knock the shark out and then break the shackles that are holding him in place. Now, whilst Captain Britain was unconscious, Slaymaster told us a little clue about where he was heading next. He said he's got a date with another kind of shark. Now that Captain Britain is conscious, he's found another clue left behind by the Slaymaster, that lighter that he used to light his cigarette. And Brian says, let's have a deco at that cigar lighter Slaymaster was using. A deco? They do like using British slang in these comics, but deco? I've never heard that in my entire life. A no prize to the first person who could tell me 
what the hell a deco is. As for the lighter, it has a KK engraved on it. And Brian realises that that is Conrad Karkov, the shipping magnate. This guy apparently is always in the news and they mention the fact that he lives on his yacht, the Mako. And the Mako is, as Slaymaster alluded to earlier, another kind of shark. So Brian escapes from the sewers and heads directly for the yacht. Before long, Captain Britain finds the yacht off the coast of Cornwall. Damn, if only Slaymaster hadn't left that lighter lying around. Or mentioned having a date with another kind of shark. Or just hung around to make sure that Captain Britain did die. Slaymaster and Conrad Karkov are on the yacht. And as Captain Britain inexplicably dives into the water, it sets off an alarm. Slaymaster is concerned, but Conrad Karkov isn't, because he has a special kind of sentry guarding the waters. Naturally, it's a robot. This time, a robot octopus. But we only see the tentacles of it. We have to wait until issue 247 for the final part of this story to see the robot octopus revealed in all of its glory. Now this robot octopus, it doesn't eat Captain Britain or even crush him in his tentacles. Instead, it injects him. Injects him with something uh, that numbs his whole body so he is now helpless. Helpless and in the clutches of Conrad Karkov, who has devised for him the most elaborate way of killing him possible. Bearing in mind he works with someone called Slaymaster, personally, I'd say Slaymaster, shoot him in the head. But that is quite boring. Instead, Conrad Karkov says, this compartment, where Captain Britain is currently being held by the robot octopus, is the ballast tank. As it floods, uh, because the yacht is also a submarine, as it floods, the yacht will submerge. The paralyzing drug will wear off as the water rises and you drown. Personally, I would have a bigger dose so it wouldn't wear off. What do I know? Not only that, but when the tank opens, his piranha fish will swarm in and eat Captain Britain. Not robot piranhas, disappointingly. Well, I suppose as long as Conrad Karkov uh, stays around to make sure Captain Britain dies, everything will be fine. Oh, no, he's off to a business meeting. Now this business meeting is with a group of individuals, each of whom wants a really rare uh, and expensive object. The objects that Slaymaster has stolen on behalf of Karkov. Now Karkov says, do you know what? I will give you these objects. All you have to do is certain things um, that I want you to do, such as one of them, he says that he wants uh, to not buy any more British steel for his factories. Another one, uh, he says he wants to cancel their contract uh, for some British built aircraft. And it goes on. They're all kind of demands relating to British industry uh, and business interests. And at the bottom it says, together uh, you can all deal a death blow to Britain's hopes for more jobs and a brighter future. It sounds really, really political with a capital P. Is this what kids were into in the 1970s? Slaymaster says it's time for him to get paid. And Karkov says, of course, come with me down to the safe. And as Karkov is turning the dial on the safe, Slaymaster thinks, this is too easy. I don't trust this guy. And he's right not to because Karkov betrays him. He steps aside and inside the safe are a load of guns that shoot Slaymaster. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You can never trust an evil mastermind. Slaymaster though was prepared for this eventuality. He was wearing a bulletproof vest and now he grabs hold of Karkov and throws him overboard to feed the sharks. Meanwhile, Captain Britain has stunned the robot octopus with the star scepter. Can you stun a robot? Is that possible? Well, if anyone can do it, Captain Britain can. He stuns the octopus, escapes from his tentacles and appears on deck, where Slaymaster is holding all of those businessmen captive. Our inevitable final battle then ensues and it ends with Slaymaster being thrown over the side of the yacht and being apparently eaten by sharks. Now I would say that's another two villains dead but we know that Slaymaster survives. There's a very abrupt ending to this tale, as in the very last panel, Captain Britain flies away from the ship and says he will leave the rest to the Royal Navy. The end. 
a very abrupt ending. It's far from perfect. There are still some of those issues that have plagued every Captain Britain story thus far. But for Captain Britain, it's really good. It is on a par in terms of quality with uh, American comics of the day. It's just a shame that we had to wait for the very last Captain Britain story of this era for it to be this good. The very last story. Oh yeah. Indeed so. Captain Britain's weekly comic was cancelled due to low sales, not because they had run out of storylines. That situation now changed. The creative team on this strip in Super Spider-Man remained consistent, and it seems they were just working through the last few stories they had left. There is no significant ending as such, and as we've already seen, the ending to this particular tale was rather rushed. The quality of storytelling picked up right at the end, but it was too little, too late and we would never again see Captain Britain in this format. That is no great tragedy, because still the characterisation and depth of plot was as lacking overall as it was back in his first appearance in Captain Britain issue 1. But all was not lost. There were six more issues of Super Spider-Man that featured Captain Britain stories, but they were all reprints of Cap's first appearance in mainstream Marvel comics. Oh yeah, thanks to the man who wrote Cap's first ever adventure, he had now made his debut in American comics. And it wasn't a one-off either. Hmm? Come on. Need you ask? 